pretty much uh, the end of the academy for uh, holding this uh, discussion. Uh, in Supreme King, and uh, asking to be part of it, I was a little hesitant because, you know, I mean, normally what happens is that you make a presentation and afterwards it gets published. But in this case, this is a discussion on something that one has published, and that too is not a book, it's just a paper. So I was very, very hesitant to begin with, but still, uh, given your enthusiasm and the kind of, you know, uh, sort of uh, inspirations that I get from my students, I thought that uh, it's only fitting that I uh, discuss a few things in this uh, particular essay, which many of you probably have read, some of you read, some of you do. Maybe this discussion will be somewhat uh, interesting for you. You see, I mean, uh, one of the advantages of teaching in JNU, and this I told you in the class before as well, and for, for that matter, this is for the first time I'm discussing a week my thesis in the class. So, uh, is that here you get students from all different parts of the country. As a result, what happens is that you are, as students, and coming from regions, you are experts from those regions. Yeah. And uh, I mean, teaching Indian politics in uh, in JNU itself is such a rewarding experience because of that. Because you know, I mean, you have much more expertise, experience, and uh, knowledge about the local politics uh, uh, that you carry with you when you come to JNU. And we can have uh, free floating discussion in the class debates and. Arguments, etc., which actually enriches all of us. Now, when I first came to JNU, I realized that uh, I was struck by the Delhi centricity of uh, some intellectuals, in the sense that uh, those who stayed in Delhi and never went out of Delhi um, and uh, had very little exposure to vernacular literature. You know, I mean, many of them were making huge comments about Indian politics. Now, it struck me, and I thought that, well, can you really understand Indian politics without understanding the regions? And in the recent time, two very important contributions have come, one from Kuritu Kaviraj and another from Dr. Chatterjee, which many of you might have seen. One is where Kaviraj writes about taking regions theoretically, seriously. And uh, uh, Chatterjee's idea of uh, relativist understanding of uh, Indian nationalism. You know, you get a really interesting sense of how regions and locality matters in our understanding of Indian politics and why it should matter. And why, you know, regional languages, vernaculars, they are so important. These linguistic groups are so important in the understanding of Indian politics. Because the basic argument is this, that you can have a formalistic institutional understanding of Indian politics in the top. But if you have to have a deeper understanding of Indian society and democracy, and the, and the sociological processes therein, you cannot not possibly have it without a sense of the cultural history of the place. And this cultural history of the regions and places cannot be accessed without a sense of this groups, these linguistic and ethnic groups, which constitute the humongous entity called Indian nation. So, as a researcher, it's very important for us to do fieldwork, because without fieldwork, you don't get a sense of what's happening at the ground level, and fieldwork can be of a different kind. You can do archival work, that, that is also called fieldwork. You can go to different areas and do uh, ethnographic work, you can do other sorts of fieldwork, discussing the research question of the classes. But the point is to look at democracy from ground level. So basically, uh, whereas an institutional focus from the top is possible at a really panoramic level, the institutional focus from the top can only be partial unless you have a view from the deeper cultural sense of democracy from the bottom. And uh, that is one of the reasons why
why you know I mean I find it very interesting to do field work and this last one year of my sabbatical, six months of that period I could spend doing my own field work after a long, long time. And without field work, it's very difficult for me to really write something substantial or meaningful. And this is a larger group project that I'm thinking of, and this is maybe the preliminary framing of that project. Now, you've noticed that this paper doesn't have much of it. This doesn't have ethnographic detail at all. This doesn't have uh, textual detail of different leaders, etc., etc. I'm now reading another prolific writer, more prolific than Ajay, who is Mamata Banerjee. <laughs> <laughs> she has about uh, 14 or 15 books, and, I'm, and, and of, the, of uh, late of the recent publications, I doubt whether uh, she takes the time to write, and whether there are others who are, you know, I mean, taking notes and writing for her. I don't know that, but the language certainly has changed. I'm trying to track the language, but uh, she has enormous, enormous uh, bit of writing in uh, Bengali language, and also in. in so, uh, you see, I mean, those are the things which are my, uh, my interviews are missing in this, my uh, larger reading of the texts of different practitioners of politics, they are missing in it. This is more a kind of a general framework through which we can actually make a sense of present Bengal politics. And, uh, you know, as it so happens that when you make an intimate understanding of a regional uh, politics, it doesn't remain confined to the region. I mean, it's not impossible that somebody might find some part of it replicable or applicable in other uh, understanding other regions of, of the country and so on. I wouldn't be surprised about that. Especially the category which has been uh, mentioned right now, chronic capitalism of non-corporate crisis. I thought that nobody really thought about it. I, mean, I, I didn't come across this in any of the texts, although you know that this has a history in the sense that it couldn't have arrived without Kalyan Sandman's research, it couldn't have uh, arrived without uh, rendition of Kalyan Sandman's research in Pakistani essays and so on and so forth. But that is probably what encapsulates the sense in which Bengal politics veers in today's uh, uh, India. In the sense that there is a kind of a condensation a fusion of power and profit in the hands of certain functionaries who govern the localities and who use the brand of party and brand of mamata in order to have a complete dominance, territorial dominance in various neighborhoods. And this territorial dominance is almost exclusive, almost monopolistic, because without this, you cannot continue to have the kind of transactions which take place here. And these transactions are partly legal, mostly illegal. In the sense that, for instance, even now, you know, I mean, uh, day before yesterday, Trinamul, uh, uh, MPs, uh, MLAs, and Panchayat functionaries, uh, they uh, held a demonstration in uh, Rajput and Jantar Mantar, demanding the uh, undue the due amount, which is the unpaid amount uh, for Narega and other, and you know, I mean, of course, I mean, this is something that the censorship believes. There's no doubt about it. Because after all, those people who walked in Narega, they are uh, the sufferers in the, in the end. But on the other hand, it's not uncommon for any researcher or journalist in Bengal to find that much of this Narega money has been misused, you know, or. Uh, Awaz Jodhana money has been misused. In the sense, it has gone in wrong hands. It has been, uh, I mean, the job cards are with uh, people who are not supposed to have those job cards with them. Uh, in some places, you know, uh, a lot of work has been shown as has been done, but you know, the work was not done by human labor. If machines were used and so on and so forth. So, you know, I mean, all sorts of uh, practices, which we usually call corruption, you know, that takes place. But at the same time, you know that corruption has uh, both sides. Uh, in the sense that where you have such a skewed distribution of resources, corruption can also be a source of livelihood for many. And uh, 
I mean, you cannot actually have a very mo mono uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, causal understanding of corruption, and you cannot have uh, you cannot brand corruption uh, as something which is unacceptable, which is evil, which is uh, uh, you know, uh, something uh, that that we have to get completely rid of, and that is why. Uh, I, I have a description of um, some questions which uh, this geographer Kundala uh, she takes about, you know, I mean, for instance, when you talk about mining, and you see that temperatures are taking place because of the involvement of the locals in illegal mining, you can raise questions as to, you know, whose property is this? After all, this is not a property which belongs to the corporate houses, or, you know, I mean, if it is a public property, it should remain with the public in some way. If the public property is being now diverted to corporate houses, then how come that if the locals do it in their own way, it is considered as corruption, but it is not considered as corruption when, you know, undue advantages are given to huge corporations uh, by the state. And, and uh, so these are the questions which are um, puzzling, which don't have any sort of uh, clear answer, so to say. And therefore, corruption can also be a way of life, but it can be part of politics. It is not necessarily something which is, uh, uh, which can be painted at, in terms of black and white as something which, has, which is reprehensible and so on and so forth. So it has both sides. It has both sides and that's the reason why, despite being corrupt, the political functionaries at the ground level can still, uh, you know, continue to have a degree of acceptance and hegemony, and and uh, you know people turn to them for uh, various sorts of uh, reasons, including uh, you know uh, get help for their children's education, for uh, getting admission in certain things, and so on. So, forth. so this continues. This is a kind of a transaction which continues which is partly moral, partly immoral, ethical, unethical, but you cannot make, this is very fuzzy area, and it cannot make a clear distinction between what is acceptable and what is not in terms of democracy from that ground level. And this messy politics is what I consider is the bread and butter of uh, many people uh, who are interested in understanding ground level politics. Uh, uh, and. Uh, Especially not in the context of just in the context of local, but in other other parts of the country as well. Now, in Bengal, the other question, I mean, apart from democracy, which uh, has been raised here, is about the party. Why is party so important? You know, I mean, I tried to answer this in some way in, in the essay, but it is not adequate in the sense that in Bengal, party played a critical role, in, especially in post independent Bengal, for refugee settlement and for land reform. These are the two important uh, uh, you know, areas in which party intervention was tremendously important. Now, the party was not directly involved in refugee settlements. You had other organizations which were affiliated to the party. But as regards land reforms, the left party, especially the CPIM, that was critical in implementing land reforms, which is because it required the distribution of property at the ground level, where you had opposition from the landed gentry, as well as sections of the bureaucracy. And uh, this could not have been done without the intervention of the party. And I have seen in other work, and in some other work, I, I should show that in doing this, the party needed a certain kind of cultural capital, because you, know, I mean, you need to know the nuances of governance. Otherwise, you cannot uh, do certain you cannot carry out certain legislative functions at the ground level. So in order to get a sense of how the government runs, you need cultural capital. And, and the people who offered this cultural capital for the party at that time were the local school teachers, mainly primary school teachers. And invariably, you know, wherever you go, you come across local school teachers who would be left in leader of the party and uh, had, would have some degree of respect Cognition in the area, people would come to them. They will become almost autonomous entities. Uh, 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 I mean, side by side the panchayat, side by side the other party organizations, and so on. 
Now, eventually, this collapsed. It collapsed because of various reasons, including the fact that, uh, you know, I mean, the salary of the teachers went up because of their unionized activities. And as your salary goes up, your lifestyle goes up, your lifestyle goes up, and your di distance with the rest of the community, that also creates a huge problem and so on. So you uh, fail to retain the kind of integrity that you had earlier and the kind of integrity you had with the uh, constituency that you were supporting. As a result, all different kinds of cleavages entered in, 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 in that sphere, and uh, the school teachers lost the kind of credibility they had earlier. And at the same time, this was, this was also the period in the post land reforms period, you had this agricultural surplus being invested in uh, various kinds of informal enterprises. Unlike many states in the South, like Andhra, Telangana, uh, uh, Tamil Nadu, or for that matter, Karnataka, you didn't have large scale uh, agrarian surplus, which then went into uh, uh, the, 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 the funding of corporate uh, enterprises. I mean, much of it went to IT and other, other kind of uh, entrepreneurships. But here it was mostly informal, informal and small scale uh, uh, kind of enterprises for which Bengal is second in terms of number only to the British. And uh, these are people you know, who had the new elite, you might say, who were emerging from the ground. Uh, they didn't have any particular political affiliation to stick to. And uh, they made use of the left parties as long as the left parties were in power. The moment the left parties lost the legitimacy after uh, the fiasco in Sindhu, Nandigram, etc. Many of you know that. You know, I mean, they quickly switched their allegiance to other political parties, only the Trinamul Congress, and now they kind of make a switch between Trinamul and BJP and, and so on. So, this is the kind of a fabric of the political change that we were witnessing. But in between, something very different happened that is the entry of the BJP. The BJP did not have any place in Bengal, and BJP rose. Uh, had a meteoric rise in Bengal in the 2019 uh, uh, and post-2019 election. So uh, uh, this uh, required to be explained, and there are various explanations. And my ground level understanding is that you know when people who voted for the left started voting for BJP, many of them did it because they wanted to save their skin. They wanted to save their skin from the ruling party in the state. Because they, I mean, especially if you look at 2018 panchayat election in the state, you know, I mean, uh, this was one of the most violent elections, and, and uh, I mean, this was uh, the Trinamool had a record number of uh, 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 unelected representatives where nobody could contest. So it was in such a situation that uh, and protection, security, these are very important things, especially where. You don't have institutional protection or institutional security from the police, etc. You know, you need people around you to protect you, and party plays a huge role in that. In that. So, if the left is unable to play the role, you need an alternative force which can play the role. And of course, the BJP at the center, with all its agencies and so on, was in a much better position to offer that kind of protection to the uh, uh, to the people at the ground level, and, and people switched. Uh, and, and I wouldn't say that ideology was not involved here. Of course, ideology was also involved. In a sense, you know, I mean, uh, this I tried to show that one of the maneuverings which Mamata did after she came to power, because she didn't have the kind of a party uh, that uh, city more, which was highly organized, etc., etc., Mamata didn't have such a party. And Mamata's party was much more chaotic, much more you know, loosely bound and so on and so forth, that she was the most important person. And therefore, what she wanted to do was to extend her uh, affiliation to the existing community <coughs> organizations. And in doing so, she uh, uh, actually, and, and mind you, Mamata was part of NDA when Gujarat program happened. And therefore, in order to get support from the Muslims in Bengal, which constitutes 30% of the population, and which were increasingly uh, 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 sort of uh, getting dissolution with the left, 
especially after the publication of such a committee report, where it was found that this thing representation was not really as much, and, and immediately after the publication of the report, and uh, this, when this disenchantment was happening among the Muslims, uh, the left wing government uh, you know, tried to implement the Langrath uh, uh, Commission report, where uh, uh, reservation was given uh, to the uh, uh, to, to the OVCs among Muslims and so on. So they tried, but it was too late, and, and, and it was not very convincing. So the Muslims were veering away from it. And as it happened, it was time for Mamuta to, to show her uh, gestures to the community, and which is, again, not a block. I mean, there are different sections, and uh, it's, it's a very heterogeneous kind of uh, uh, group of people. But Mamuta tried her best through the uh, religious leaders of Muslim organization to extend her affiliation to this community. And uh, she succeeded. Uh, but in order to do so, she created a public image uh, uh, which, you know, read BJP's allegation of our Muslim appeasement uh, 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 appear as true. You know, I mean, uh, it doesn't matter whether Muslims actually benefited from her policies, because they didn't. But the, the very charge of Muslim appeasement stuck because of the gestural and symbolic politics that she was doing for a very long time in order to get support of, uh, of, of this particular uh, community. Now, as a result, what happened that there was a kind of a shift, partly ideological, but mostly, I, I, I think, existential shift from the left to BJP among the voters. And as a result, the left is, doesn't have any representative in the legislative assembly right now or in parliament from Bengal. I mean, this is just unimaginable if you compare it with what happened in 2006, with the last election where the left actually swept uh, 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 the state. So all this taken together created a situation in which the what I call this uh, franchisee politics, that is a model of the franchisee run by the local leaders using Momota and the party as a brand to carry out their transaction and dominance at the territorial level of uh, different parts of the state. You know, this is something which has evolved. And uh, uh, it has evolved within the party society where Momota doesn't have such a strong party as it has had. So this is a kind of a situation that I see. But at the same time, the, the silver lining is this, that in franchisee politics, you need not just, you have not just conflict, uh, which creates and procreates violence, but you also need collaboration. Collaboration between people, because without collaboration across different ethnic and religious groups, you cannot run the non-corporate economy. The non-corporate economy, by its very definition, you know, it, it, it relies on a certain degree of cooperation and collaboration on the part of people, irrespective of their uh, cultural, religious uh, location. And, and with 30% population as Muslims, and which has a contiguous presence in Bengal, you know, any kind of communal conflict, and communal conflict had been uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, had taken place very frequently with the advent of BJP, but there's a limit to which it can happen. Because people cannot afford to have communal conflict which uh, can ruin it, their own existence as well as their own survival, their, their economy, their livelihood. So in this kind of franchising model, in this kind of transactional politics, you need a certain collaborative mechanism between people across religion, religious divides, where wedge politics does not work. And I think that this is a kind of a structural possibility, apart from other cultural, you know, I mean, uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, sort of moorings which I mentioned in the article. This is a kind of a structural deterrence for the uh, for wage politics to polarize Bengal socially within its electoral map of polarization. So uh, uh, 
uh, and, and that we are seeing, for instance, uh, after the 2021 election, where, you know, I mean, the Hindu votes uh, uh, veered in one direction for BJP and a bulk of Muslim votes, 75% of the Muslims voted for Mamta Banerjee. And, and that was out of sh sheer sense of survival after CA and NRC. You know, what is now happening is that much of these votes, both from the so-called Hindu, so-called Muslim, they are now returning to the left and the Congress. All the by-elections which have taken place, they showed that the margins are changing. The municipal elections, they show that the margins are changing. Apart from the fact that in North Bengal recently there was an election where the BJP has done much better, but because, again, I mean, there the BJP is playing the card of, 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 of the community, of the Rajvamshis, in, in a very dangerous manner where they are, uh, a section of the Rajvamshis were demanding the partition of Bengal between North and South, and, and local leaders of the BJP have uh, given uh, voice to that call. So, you know, I mean, this is, this is a very special case, this is a very distinctive case, but taking that out, in all other elections, the trends are showing a different kind of uh, election uh, uh, from the 2021 elections. And I'm not surprised if this trend continues, uh, given the kind of structures and strains that we have in place. So this is the overall you know, I mean, I mean, structure of the argument, but I'm sure that there are other nuances which can be discussed. But with this, I give the floor to my friends, Ajay and Ajay.